away from lecturing as well. Um, and they've taken a totally different pedagogical approach to their delivery through um, throughout their curriculum. So we know that Nottingham Trent University now uh, have of delivering um, more of a blended model categorically across all of their provision, which which is which is impacting on their on their sort of service really. I mean they've gone more of a, a more dynamic and more interactive as they're going along. Um, so what are we going to focus on then? So our four key things. So we've got, um, we're going to, hopefully by the end of the session, is you're going to be able to identify five key golden ideas to develop your lectures. We're going to explore a concept called pancake questioning. And this concept of pancake questioning, it serves as a tool for engagement. And it also serves as a tool for formative assessment as well. So it serves as dual purpose. We're going to hopefully identify where your developments are in your lecturing practice. And we're going to examine the concept of structure within a lecture environment. So we're going to look at how the, a sort of a lecture's structured and um, how we can change that to make that more dynamic. Uh, Musa, do you have a question? No, no question from Musa. OK. No, not any. OK, mate, no worries. I'm just going to press because it just says here, and I'm just going to lower your hand. There we go. All right. So we've got eight people joined us now. OK, that's great. Bakary is going to join us now as well, which is fantastic. All right. So. Let's move on. So one of the thir first things we need to think about from a lecture perspective now, irrespective of whether you're delivering a lecture to, to 11 people or whether you're in um, Hawthorne 046. I think it is, which is that absolutely monstrous lecture theatre. Um, about 400 people, I think. It's a huge place. Irrespective of the sort of lecture that you're delivering, what we need to do is generate a spark. OK, now a spark stands for a strong performance attribute to require knowledge. Essentially, we need to build our knowledge around our audience. OK. Our, recognize the knowledge around the demographic that's in the room now we're very big at the Montfort university around driving this concept of universal design learning. one of the things we do talk about a lot on our pg cat programs is around getting to know your students however you cannot be expected to know or get to know 400 odd students that are in that that are in that lecture theatre. It would be unfair of us at the institution to ask around all those around those four hundred different students. Um, so what we would like you to do is, from a lecturing perspective, is you need to think about well, how can I engage my students from go? All right. The most the sort of the key area for engaging students is around gathering that element of interest. And you li you've literally got 10 seconds to grab the student's attention. As soon as you as soon as you start, grab the student's attention as soon as they walk in. So we need to think about what is your instant attention grabber. OK, so you need to think about that. What I'd like you to do is two minutes and i'm going to set a timer on my phone so i know when we've got two minutes is for the first two minutes individually reflect on your practice okay and i would like you to think about what is what are your strengths to delivering to a large group of students all right you don't have to think of like, give me hundreds of strengths just give me one or two of your strength areas what are your strengths delivering to a large group of students and then we'll come back more on this idea of this attention grabber. And what I'd like you to do is I would like you to put your. Um, your feedback in the chat channel, so the chat box on the right hand side, if you can give me your um, your feedback in that chat channel after two minutes, that will be fantastic. All right, I'm going to um, set a timer. Okay, you've got two minutes individually reflect what are your strengths delivering to a large group of people and their feedback in the chat section on the right hand side two minutes away you go
Okay, we've got last 15 seconds. So comments on the right hand side, please, in the chat. Some good stuff coming through though. Rachel suggesting nice relaxed atmosphere. That's great. Bakery's giving us generic examples. Yeah, that's fantastic. Starting off with some creative activities from Shimin. Nice, Mario, using some creative ideas. Okay, so two minutes is up. So let's just have a look at the top here, what sort of things we've got. So we're talking about your strength areas delivering to a large group. So Kuengen gives us clear logical structure and good, good content and a well-prepared session. That's really important. Students will take a lot from that. If you go into a session and you're delivering something that's very well prepared, it's got clear logical structure, it's got really good content. So when we talk about good content, Kuengen, what sort of thing, when you talk about good content, how would you define good content? You there, Song? She's giving us an answer down at the bottom. Let's have a look. Yeah, good sessions will have a, um, what do you call it? Uh, good content should have a clear, good beginning. Uh, middle yeah. And yeah, nice one, Moose. Yeah, so good. Yeah, so let's say clear logical structure, good sort of good beginning, middle, and end. And that's really relevant. I mean, and like, um, and like Sung's put at the end there about relevant to learning outcomes and related to the uh, to practical ex exercises. It's this idea that um, everyone, ha everything that people do has real purpose and has real value. It all links and it all aligns to the, to not just the assess the um, the learning outcomes, but also the assessment practices and what students have what students are actually undertaking in the session. I like what Rachel's put there around relaxed atmosphere. I think that's really important. I think when we talk about um, this idea of a lecture theatre, lecture theatres can be really daunting for some people. And if some and if people and students are sitting there thinking that they're going to get singled out or they're going to get um, they're going to get uh, Pick, well picked on for answers then there's going to be a fear there's going to be a fear culture created and when we're talking about lack of attend lack of attendance in lectures that's one of the sort of the key contributors to around lack of attendance it's around students not feeling safe in that environment now they might students might not feel safe for a variety of different things so that could be content specific it could be level that it's being picked at it could be how the information's delivered it could be down to the fact that they don't feel safe in that particular environment, which is which are all key contributors, really. One of the things we need to make sure is that as soon as people walk into a lecture, is that we've got something that grabs their attention straight away. And we want that in the first 10 seconds because that is our biggest opportunity to instantly grab the student's attention. So what you need to think about is think about how you're setting that lecture up. OK, when students walk into that lecture. Has the lecture been set up? Do students clearly see that, a, that the environment is ready for learning to take place? If you're like most people within the institution and like me, that you that your timetable like sort of back to back in different areas, what you need to think about is, well, how can I make sure that if if students are waiting for me to get to a session, what is there for people to do prior to that? And this is where we have the idea of things like pre-prepared resources, online storage. We have things like um, activation activities. And one of the things I've started to use is around um, anybody that we tend to get now on our programs in pod, we get a lot of PhD students and we get a lot of PhD students that are lot looking for teaching. So if we're struggling to get to um, if we're struggling to get into sessions on time, what we can do is we can get some one of our PhD students to come and just start the session off for us, give them a little bit of introduction around their their delivery, their research and things. But the key thing is it's around something for them to grab their attention. So this can be something very simple. This can be something as simple as having a question on the board. This can be something as simple as having an activity for them to get their hand, to get themselves stuck into, like a menti question. It can be it can be something like a video to watch. It can be an audio clip. It can be something like a podcast. You may have already set something for them to read or to extract information from, which they can talk about in their groups. 
on the flip side to this, if you don't have something for them to get their teeth into, to get them active instantly within that session environment, what might start to occur Anyone want to come in with that? What might start to occur if we if we just tend to have some sort of dead time? Disinterest from Anne. Yeah. Nice. Reg just posted the question on the side there. And how can you set this up if you're not in the room? Well, you can set that up by things like um, communication with the students through Blackboard. We can set this up through at the end of the at the end of a session. We can give the students clear instructions as to what to do with, upon arriving on the next session. It's all about information, really. It's all around it's all around preparing the students around in things like Blackboard um, announcements. Yeah, some sort of sort of small flipping session. Absolutely. Some sort of sort of outside activity. One of the things you need to be aware of with flipping the session is around how the modules delivered. So, for example, if, if students are signing up for taught modules, there is, a, there is a direct understanding that the students will be taught in the learning environment. If students sign up for a distance or a blended model, then there is the expectation there that they will do some outside studies. However, if we're asking students to do some degree of flip activity, we absolutely have to guarantee that whatever they do outside of the learning environment is then being brought in and used. So Rachel's point there around some small flip session is, is exactly right. We can get the students to do some small piece of, of reading, watch a video clip, watch a piece of audio, and then bring that in. And then the questions that's on the board, if we could get someone, a colleague, or we can post those questions on the Blackboard to get students to kick off with, that could be something we can use to really help support and set up that lecture. When we're talking about student engagement, Stefan, question? Yes, if you if you are okay with asking questions. Of course I am, Stefan, especially from you, my friend. Uh, so often in a lecture, you have some sort of technical stuff you have to tell students, like, you know, exams and, and timing of other sessions and whatever. Would you recommend, in case you have such announcements or whatever it is, to do them first, then start with your actual lecture and the sort of 10 seconds, or would you recommend to really start with the content, try the 10 seconds attention grab, and at some point later, put in the announcements or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all, a, it's all a process of trial and error, really. It's all a process of, well, what you need to trial something with your students. I mean, if you're not physically in the room, as some as someone said earlier, then you're very much reliant upon what you can, the information that you can get out to the students. Um, and that's often the that's often the key stumbling block. But if you can, um, I would say that the sort of the early stages really need to be the attention grabber. So they really need to set the scene as to what you're going to be um, delivering within the session itself. I would say try and steer clear around the sort of the, the main content. Just use that early portion of the session as a as an activator or as something to recap. Because what you've got to bear in mind is that if you, you might be struggling to get to the session on time, there may be other people as well that are struggling to get to the session on time. We know that um, we know that obviously student attentions can be can be variable, but then there's always people turning up late irrespective. It doesn't matter what time of the day you put a session on, you'll always get someone coming in late just by having that sort of activator or that early portion of the, of the session that set up for a starter activity or to, to sort of captivate and engage the, the room you can really draw in those students that are coming in late and give those people that may be late because they've got things like caring responsibilities or they've got traveling responsibilities just gives them the chance to get to the room before before they might miss any major content so that's where a flip task comes in really useful for that because then they can access that material and that content so they're not penalized but i would say whatever works well for your students you've got to try you've got to trial a selection of different things really does that answer your question you. no worries all right so setting up one of the things you need to think about is controlling the controllables all right control what you can control if you can't control um 
if you can't control certain aspects, like for example, the the room, for example, you might have a lecture theatre that is absolutely huge, um, yet you've only got a small amount of students in that lecture theatre. Then what you need to do is you can control that environment where you can get those students to come and sit down towards the front to make sure it's all sort of nicely compact and you can talk to people without having to move and circulate the room. One of the things we tend to see quite often in, le in lesson observations is that when we go to these lecture theatres and there's not many people in there is that students are really sort of scattered around the room. We want to try and get those students to come down and feel part of the group. So Mariam's asked a question there, just to clarify, you, you've suggested using something unrelated to the topic at the start. You can do what you can do something. I wouldn't say being unrelated. I would say it needs to be so it needs to be focused around what what the students are studying. So within that can be something that can be loosely based around the content. So, for example, you may have seen something that in the local press, you may have seen something in a journal or a research paper that that links into the curriculum. It can be something that um, from a recap perspective. Recaps are always a really good thing to start off with, because what that does is that reignites what they learned previously and then brings that into the next session and keeps it relevant. You want to think about how can you get, how can you sort of reignite what students already know and build on that for the next session. And that's where things like starter activities are really useful for those sorts of things. So in schools and um, FE colleges around the country now, they're being tasked a lot with how they take student surface level learning um, and transfer that to deep level learning. And the way they do that is by using a lot of what's called retrieval practice um, activities. And so what they do is they get students to just look back and, and just try and, and think about what do they know, what can they recall. And they get them to do things like mind maps and just have discussions and conversations and stuff. And within higher education, that's one of the things that we massively overlook. It's what, is, what has fallen into the students' sort of deep, deeper memory. And what is what do students really understand? So you want to think about those sorts of things is using starter activities at, at the start of the session, but that focus on retrieval and recap. So I would say, Mariam, to answer your question is it's what I would say where possible, it has to be related to the subject. If you want to go really far out, then by all means have something unrelated. But in mind, if it's unrelated, students start to question the relevance of what you're of what you're using you have to be able to pack that up all right so what we're going to do is now we're going to move on to these uh these are these golden ideas okay so we've got five of these to look at and to, and to chip in with we're going to kick off with the first one the first one is around the use of images and audio now in a lecture setting it's for your sort of main strands of engagement within with the students are the sort of the, the, the through the senses or right? art visual or the auditory sort of more kinesthetic more sort of the tactile types things but the use of images and audio where possible can be really powerful because if we're in a nice or a really big lecture setting we've got a nice big auditorium upon which to share those images oh kind of a bit too quick um, so what I'd like you to think about is within the chat option, I'm going to give you three minutes and whilst you're doing that, I'm going to play, um, I'm going to play a video and whilst the video is playing, what I would like you to think about is around, um, what's more powerful in a learning setting? Is it audio? Is it images? Is it text, the written word, or is it all three? What do you think has real impact on that learning experience? All right. So I'm going to give you three minutes again, and then you can feedback via the chat on the right hand side. What's more powerful in the learning setting? Is it audio, images, text, or all three? All right. So I'm going to uh, play this video. Oh, I don't think I'll work. Right, hold on a minute. I'm going to try and play a video and hopefully 
it'll it'll work. Video won't work while you're in there. Uh, will it not? Hold on then. I'll play. What I'll do. What I'll do. I'll play it and I'll share my desktop. If I can do that, it's really testing my IT skills. This today. Here we go. Right. Hold on a second. Then let's see if I can share this. So back to this. And if I go to share, if I share my screen and share audio. Right, here we go. Let's try and do this. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's our three minutes there. Two minutes of a bit of a video, and then back to now. I've got to go back to my files, share that again, and then we were on that slide, weren't we? There we go. Okay, so let's go back to our chat. All right, now let's have a look then. So we're talking about, so Shamim kicked us off with a good balance of all three. Rachel's opted for more visual, Alfred all three, Stefan, your combination. Uh, Mariam all three, most of the text, they'll be very effective. Students have preferences, so as balance, excellent, yeah. All right, students get bored of videos for more than one minute. All right, so. Let's address that to kick off with then from uh, Amit. Um, students, get, students get bored with videos of more than one minute. The reason why students get bored is it may be lack of relevance to what they're studying. It may be the lack of connection that's in that video. If you were to say to the students, watch this video, watch this one minute video or watch this four minute video, every element of this four minute video is going to be in your assessment and help you get a distinction. They would watch every every element of that video it's around the sort of it's around the motivators as to why do i need to watch that video so 
you have to think about well where's the, where's the relevance in that so we've mentioned here around uh mariam's picked up and said around i would say all three now one of the benefits of all three is the right that someone's mentioned here students have preferences but what we need to find is around a, a nice balance of those two you need to think about the environment as to where you are if you've got a really nice big auditorium you've got a really nice big screen and you can really use the, like images and audio to really make that lecture as sort of immersive and as interactive as possible then by all means go for it when it comes to text you're more likely to switch students off with a whole load of text on a screen and have something that's text heavy as opposed to having something like this now this uh this image was taken from um one of my powerpoints from when i used to teach many years ago and i used to be when i was used to teaching vocational education i used to be a lecturer in painting and decorating so this image on the screen is literally a picture of watching paint dry this is how paint dries um and one of the things we have to do was we have to educate students on how how paint dried and did it we, the nature of our demographic was around um they were very disengaged students they were very um they had a lot of barriers a lot of, a lot of issues knocking around from a learning perspective and a lot of them have to reintegrate the education again but one of the things we did find is that images work really well to allow us as lecturers to explain around and as uh, alongside so we were able to use images for really good effect and we found that images were really good at engaging students because we could print those images off and we could give those images out and students could make notes and annotations around those images to put their own understanding around those images as opposed to us putting loads of text on the screen and having students that probably had some degree of dyslexia or learning barriers and learning difficulties really struggling around um struggling around the content of the of the images that are on the side so i think uh Emma, is your question around students get bored around videos of one minute think about the relevance and the importance of that video do you need to play a video is it a good video is it something that's is it is it relevant is it current do students recognize themselves in that video that's usually that's one of the key stumbling blocks is that students fail to see the relevance within that video or they fail to recognize themselves in any of the content that's around that so not only can you have sort of images taken around um or taken to support exploration you can have images that are there and designed to promote a response so we want a response we've got an image there and we've got some we've got some some text on the side all right so this slide depicts a bit of interaction in a session so we've got an image which is a piece of which is a piece of artwork from banks's and then it's got um a question on there and what the question steering students around it's asking them to share their thoughts do they think it's vandalism or do they think it's art and what we've done is we've given them a mechanism to contribute and to, in, and to engage with so that there is share your thoughts online via twitter using the hashtag now what we're doing is we're getting students to use their mobile devices in that lecture theater but what we're getting them to do is again to use it positively in the sense that they're engaging with social media but also engaging with their mobile phones to interact and contribute to the session now the thing with mobile phones is around it's around how comfortable you are with using these sorts of things and around using these sorts of um, approaches because at the end of the day phones are not going to go away students will always have a phone always have a device in front of them the thing is now we it's about well how can we embrace this how can we use this and how can we get the students to use this for for the good of their learning experience and things like this where they're able to sort of able to share social media they're interacting it gives the idea that we've, we're very current we're very sort of on trend with using social media twitter is a very safe thing to use because it's only it's a limited amount of characters and it can be it can be um the hashtag allows us to categorize it so the hashtag means that it's all collated together in one particular part of twitter so we can find that very easily if you're not comfortable on using things like Twitter, if you're not comfortable on using things like social media in sessions, that's no problem because there are other things that we can get the students to contribute to via their 
um, mobile devices. We're using one now, so on Blackboard Collaborate, students can contribute via the chat button on the right-hand side. We can deal with things like Padlet and Mentimeter, which we'll go through in a bit. We've got things like um, just big images, just things that are thought-provoking thought and things that we can get students to sort of elaborate and talk around. Now, this, this image was taken by um, Hubble Space Telescope. And this show depicts like thousands of different galaxies and things. And it would be something if you can get an image on there that has got no text around um, and no dialogue around it, we can get students to give you an opinion or a thought around what they might think it is. It can be really, really thought provoking and really challenging. In the same way, we can get students to do things like compare and contrast activities where we can get them to take give us clear differences. So we've got two different posters here from two different sort of eras. We've got um, one poster that's on the right hand side that's very much from the sort of the early um, early sort of uh, 1930s, not sort of 1920s, 1930s, where things like smoking was very much um, not celebrated, but it was seen as something that, that served the medical purpose. Whereas today, picture on the left hand side, you've got something um, that depicts a sort of modern attitude towards smoking and the real sort of the catastrophic health impacts that smoking brings. So if we had two po two pictures on there, we can get students to give us give us a bit of a compare and contrast activity and we can get students to give us some feedback as we're going along. If we've literally got 300 students in a lecture theatre, we're going to manage this differently we're still going to put that post this slide up but we're not going to want to take feedback from 300 400 students we may want to take feedback from small pockets of students students that feel comfortable and confident with contributing and that's really important is we don't want to be singling out any students we don't want to be going to students and asking for answers until we know that we're going to get some answers from those students and we're confident that they have the ability to um, to give us what we need. So this infographic on the um, on the screen is one that we've um, that we've put together for our PG Cert program. And, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to demonstrate the difference in our student demographic at DMU. This very much serves two purposes here. It serves a purpose for me demonstrating infographics to you now. But it also serves the purpose of, of identifying our student demographics. So this is taken from our 17, 2017 data. And it shows you the different uh, demographics of students. So 54% students from main backgrounds, 20% declared disabilities at DMU, compared to 12% to of students um, declaring disabilities in the sector. So we're above that sort of national average for declaring disabilities. We've got 2,700 international students, we did have, we've got, um, now one of the interesting things that really jumps out at me here is around this bit at the bottom that talks about average UCAS entry points. So it's, we know now that this total drops three points an academic year. So we know that this year we're going to be looking at an average UCAS entry point tariff of 97. UK century points. Now that's very low. Now, but what we need to bear in mind is that if we think about what's happening currently with COVID nineteen and all the all the sort of ramifications around that, we could we could hazard a guess that UK century points will be lowered even further. So when we're thinking about okay, we know that we we've got this information about students. We're going to be thinking about well, we're going to have. A student demographic in our in front of us at a lecture theatre. We're not essentially going to have an understanding of the student's ability to uh, to sort of digest and process large amounts of information that we're passing on via that lecture mechanism. That's where things like um, activities such as compare contrast, thought provoking images, uses of social media and other images for students to explain around are going to come in really handy in lectures because we're going to help sort of support those students and give them a different level of interaction around that. 
economy. Does anybody have any questions so far? Bakri, any questions? Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, actually, in the classroom design as well, and if you have something with images or anything like that, you'll try to whether to to have the students uh, paying attention to you or to the screen. And in at the Montfort, we have some um, classrooms which have two screens. Um, yeah. I found, personally, I found it very, very distracting. Mm, yeah, I noticed that in, um, is it Bead House? I think in Bead House, a lot of the rooms there have all got the, the, lot the they've got a couple of screens on the go, haven't they? Uh, yeah, and uh, Cleveland as well. Yeah, I mean, with the screens, yeah. with the screens, it's all about really how you can, um, like you say, they can become very distracting. So students are looking at the different screens and trying to absorb things. And a lot of the times with people tend to put too much information on the PowerPoints. So realistically, your PowerPoint shouldn't really serve as your main source of information. It should really serve as um, as a backdrop, as something that poses questions, I would say. Um, we tend to see that a lot of people use them like categorically as their main driver for information. But what we want students to do is we want them to interact and tease out information as much as possible. Um, We've got a really there's a really good point there from uh, Ahmed is around uh, with a smartphone in every pocket or in front of every student. How can I encourage students to use their smartphones for learning purposes only during the lectures? But what you do is you manage that how you see fit, because one of the things we don't realise is that we irrespective of where we are, whether it be a classroom in Cleffin, a, a, a workshop in uh, Queens or um, a lecture theatre in Hawthorne. It's our learning environment and we dictate what happens within that learning environment. So if students have got their phones in front of them, what you want to do is try and use them and interact with them as much as possible. If you don't want students to have their phones, if you don't want students to uh, be engaged with your phones, you have to be very direct and you have to be um, you have to let students know because you can't just make an assumption that students are going to have their phones out and use them for those sort of positive purposes. We have to make sure that students are very clear on what the protocol is within that learning environment. I mean, it's the, it's the same when I, I've been into, um, I went into a, a lecture observation in, um, it was in Hawthorne and it was in, that was in Hawthorne. Yes, it was in Hawthorne. It was on one of the lecture theatres on the on the sort of the ground floor. I think it was like zero thirty three, something like that. And I sat right at the back, and the the lecture theatre was full, and the lecturer was standing at the front. He was he was delivering his lecture, and I mean, it, it, his lectures go. It was it was it was perfectly fine. But this, I could see sitting at the back. I could see what every student was looking at from their laptops. And I could see that the students were, were looking at Amazon, they were looking at Argos, there was a student sitting not too far from me that was looking at H. Samuels at watches. They were looking at everything else other than actually looking at the sessional content. Now, my a couple of points still jumped out at me from that was that do the students need to have the laptops out? If they're taking notes, brilliant, that's fine. Take some notes. If they're not taking any notes, they don't need to have the laptops out. But one of the things that the lecturer didn't do is the lecturer did not move from that podium at the front and they stood at that podium at the front and what that does was that gives the students the green light to be able to look at those laptops and just look at anything that they like from a lecturing perspective what you need to be quite confident with is your movement around the lecture theater so feel free to move away from the lectern. Now, I know what you're thinking is, is around, well, I need to be at the lectern because I'm recording the session. Well, actually, every lectern within the Monfort is fitted with a lockable box. And in that lockable box, there is a wireless microphone. There's two wireless microphones, in fact. And those wireless microphones are automatically linked to the channel of the, of the, the PC that's in that learning environment so you can put that wireless microphone on and switch it on and clip it to your collar or your your top or whatever you're wearing and you can walk around that lecture theater and you will be the microphone will pick up every word that you're saying and it will transfer it directly onto your panopto recording 
You can also get remotes from AV loans that will enable you to sl to go between the different slides whilst you're walking around that lecture theatre. What the students are now expecting is for you to walk around. From a management perspective, that's one of the best things you can do is because students will not be expecting you to be moved to be mobile and to be moving around. The reason why one of the things is from a point of view um, with students using their mobile phones for, for something that's non specific to learning is the fact that no one knows what they're doing. So students think that they can just do what they want to do and, and get away with it. But if you're actively patrolling that learning environment, then you'll be able to go up to the students and just say, what are you looking at there? Concentrate on what you're doing. I get exactly the same problem um, on staff development programmes. I get staff looking at things on the laptops that they're not supposed to, but the majority of the time it's emails for me because staff need to access emails or they're worried about missing something by emails or they're under pressure to get something else done so that tends to be my reason why they've got phones out or they've got laptops out and they're not focusing. i mean and that and that's a more of an environmental sort of culture thing that we need to that we need to address all right glad to see that mariam agrees with uh what we're talking about there but yeah exactly Walking around really helps get in touch with students, particularly when they're working through questions. Exactly. You can walk around, you can talk to students that little bit more. If you pose an activity, you can get up there, you can talk to students. What are they finding? What sort of things are they are they going through? Uh, back here, another question. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, actually for the benefit of everyone. It's just a comment. Um, before moving to Dumont in my previous university, there was um, a software which was trialed actually by a company. And actually, once the students are inside the lecture theater, all the Wi-Fi will only be connected to what is delivered and around the material that we are delivering, so they cannot access oh, anything yeah. outside at all. Yeah, interesting. What was that software called? I can't remember it too many years now, sorry. Yeah, we I'll used to find out. Yeah, I know the sort of stuff you make. So when I was working at Leicester College, we had something in um, RIT suites that when students were logged in, we, we had like a master computer. We had this program where we could see absolutely everything that students were looking at on our screen so the screen sort of broke down broke down into loads of different sort of different tiles and you could see so if you had 20 students in a room you had 20 different images on your your computer and you could see what students were working on all the time really interesting yeah it'd be interesting to find out what software that is i know in, i used to work at Coventry university and we didn't we didn't use anything like that but um we had similar issues with students and using um, their own devices. But the thing is, I mean, if you, if you if you manage the session, if you give students instruction, if you get students to sort of do this idea around co-creating their sort of lecture guidelines, what do they buy into, what do they not buy into? And I think as long as something has relevance and as long as there's always something for the students to sort of engage with, then they'll tend to participate. If you're talking about you've got a really long window of dialogue, so if you're saying in an hour's lecture you just talk for an hour, students are going to switch off and students are going to start to look at phones and things. Because whether we like it or not, the student's mobile device is more interesting than what we're talking about. Now we could be talking about some really important, paramount importance. So it could be like we're talking about what's going to happen with their with their dissertations and their finals. Yet they might get a text message from their friend that will take precedence over what we're telling them, and it's always going to be it's always going to be the sort of the the way for, the way around it. But what we need to do is if our sessions are interesting, if they're engaging, if they're captivating, if we're in tune with the students, and if we're giving the students enough opportunities to digest what we're saying, we'll get that interaction. We'll talk we'll touch on that again in, in a sec. So I've put an infographic on here. Infographics are really useful to use. I'm just going to share my screen again because I want you to um, see what I do here. Oh my God, I'll tell you what. Here we go. Right. So infographics are really good. Now, what we can do is we can get really good um, access to infographics now via, um, can I see my screen again? Oh, that's gone a bit strange. So if I click on um, Microsoft, now so i'm just so happens i'm an office 365 but this will still work on your desktop applications as well if you go to application and if you go to 
if you go to PowerPoint, and then as you look at the PowerPoint screen here, if you look at the top, you've got your template, you've got your search for online, and then across the top here, you've got um, options. On the far right hand side, you've got infographics. And what this gives you now, it gives you templates of infographics which you can access and change. And you, these are all adaptable and all interchangeable. So just here, look, this is the one I used. And it just gives you a different way of presenting information. Now, these are all PowerPoint slides and these are all interchangeable. So you can change the text in there and then you can save that and then you can use that in your and import it in and use that within your presentations, within your handouts. And it's a really nice way of just presenting different information within different if different contexts. Right, let's go back. Here we go. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so where were we? Let's go back. So, so your first golden idea then is to think about how you use audio and think about how you use um, images and infographics. So Mariam has put a point um, here around the challenge with maintaining engagement with content is when the content is quite dry. OK, that's an interesting point. What, one of your biggest challenges is around, is around making that, not making the content dry. It may come across as dry, but you, the role of the lecturer now is to make it as active and as engaging and as dynamic as possible. And that is a real challenge. Now, it, it is possible because I used to teach things like health and safety to um, to students or, and we used to teach things like working at high act. And we were always telling students about rules, regulations, the laws and the legalities behind it. And that was a really dry subject. But we used to change it and make it as dynamic and as interactive as possible by bringing in those elements of sort of, uh, of competition and collaboration studies and problems and scenarios and those sorts of things and that used to work really well um, we'll chip on some more as we're going along Marion okay so second point we're going to look at is around structure so the structure of our um, of our lectures so what we need to think about is around um, some key points really around the intentions so from a lecture perspective is what is the intention of the lecture what is the uh, what is the purpose the outcome or the objective of the session what do we want to get out of that specific lecture and that's a really key point that we need to bear that in mind we need to think about the transmission so think about the message that we're sending out to those students and is that message clear so from a transmission perspective we don't want to be we don't want to um, encounter any degree of disruption within that delivery we want to make sure that students are able to receive the transmission so enabling any barriers to that receipt um, to that reception of the transmission being removed we want to think about the outputs as well as what do we want the students to, to, to bang out at that point and then we want to think about the practical implications of that I mean realistically are, are we asking sort of we don't want to be asking students to do things like um, aerobic workouts within a lecture setting because it's the setting doesn't suit the task that we're asking them to do Okay, what I'd like to do is I would like to go to your mobile devices, please. I would like you to go to menti.com and I would like you to use the code 428429. And I would like you to uh, answer the question uh, Is your lecture for delivering uh, general program information, modular content, exam assessment information? or all of the above. All right. Now, this is around as establishing what the purpose of our lectures is, OK? So just a quick minute or two on that. So menti.com and then use the code 428449, please.
Sorry, what was the code again? It's four two eight four four nine. Thank you. If I wrote it, if I wrote it wrong on that PowerPoint. Got a couple more answers that we've managed to get four answers in so far. Six people engaging so far, which is great. All right, seven people. Okay, so what we'll do is, we'll, I mean, we'll, ju we'll just push on. So the idea of this point is around we need to establish what we what our lecture is for. OK, now the reason why we need to establish what the lecture is for is that we get a lot of mixed information within lectures. All right, students get bombarded with things like general program information. They'll get exam assessment information. They'll get modular content chucked in there as well. OK, so we get all of these parts all sort of amalgamated together and what we need to do is we need to think about do you know what what do we want the students to know and, know, and this is really difficult because the, we often have loads of information to pass on to the students and the students do get bombarded with um with information we've started um in in organizational development we've started delivering our pg cap program now and we did a we did a bit of an audit around what sort of emails staff are being sent on their student emails and w there was i think at the time of logging in so students hadn't even finished the first module yet and they had 80 generic emails from this from the institution which is a hell of a lot of of emails really just based on just based on on generic information really stuff that don't really need to know so what we need to think about is what information are we doing now if the student needs assessment and exam information we need to make sure that they get that at a separate point if they need general program information that's really for things like modular inductions is it possible to put that onto blackboard yes granted there's the old idea around students probably won't access that information but we can steer students to it we can sign post students to it all the time what we need to think about is that from a point of view of our lecture driven content we have to keep it specifically focused on point number three. I mean, it's came out third, really, but people are saying that we're covering all the But we need to think about the modular content that we're delivering. Okay, so think about that. It's thinking about is everything we're doing holding on to that relevance for the students? Because if we don't start to keep it to modular specific content, students will um, students will switch off essentially we'll, we'll start to lose students we don't want to lose students we want to get them keep them focused around um the modular specific content but if we're bombarding them with loads of different stuff that's what's going to happen is they're going to start to switch off okay so one of the things we talked about around engagement around thinking about our, our content and, what, and this was one of the sort of the turning points really at Northampton University when they started to think about well do you know what do we actually need lectures do we need to keep that lecture format or can we start to think about something something different it's around uh well wait a minute slides of uh wrong way around there that one there we go all right is around structure now in a lecture setting we have something called um oh, i can't remember what it's called now but it's got you'll come back to me but we've got we've got areas we've got high attention we've got low attention okay so when students first walk into that room they're going to have high attention the more we keep them in that environment and the more unactive they st they um they stay the lower their attention so what we need to try to do is we need to drive um a more of a change 
format. And what we need to do is we need to operate um, what we call a spiked model. So instead of having that consistent level of dialogue, what we need to have is we need to have interference within that consistent dialogue. So what we're suggesting is, and this is something I operate quite a lot in the, in the lectures that I deliver, it's around we have elements of um, the session that are at different times and at different sort of portions. Now this links into universal design learning because we can we can align this with um, variation, we can align this with variety, we can also align this with what's called differentiation. So we can use, we can have different elements of this session at different levels, at different times. What we don't do at this point is we don't compromise anything that we're delivering. We're still delivering the same amount of content. What we are doing though, we're giving the students opportunity to digest, discuss, um, sort of compartmentalize the information that's being delivered. Now, from a point of view of student engagement, is one of the things that you may experience in a lecture theatre is you may experience pockets of sort of what we what we class as low level disruption. So students just having little pockets of discussion um, and dialogue, just at times when we've we've not um, we've not given them an opportunity to discuss. Now that can be for various things really. That can be because they're just engaging in some sort of idle, idle chit chat. But um, what it can also be, it can be the students trying to probably catch up talk about the content but it might be the students trying to somehow put it into words that they can understand and they can digest so the, how this sort of spike model works is that you have a starter activity or a starter period for five minutes obviously other yeah, students still working in interactives there um, then you've got a lecture so what you would do is you would lecture for 10 minutes or so after those 10 minutes you would just pause and then you're going to pose the students a question. Now that question needs to be focused specifically on what you've just lectured about. All right. And what that does is that question gives the students, it gives them something to put relevance into what you're lecturing about. So that question should then get them to try and extract some information around what you've just been talking about. All right. Then you can have some sort of you can have some sort of discussion with the students, or you can get the students to discuss it amongst themselves. Then you can go back. You can lecture again. Okay. You lecture for five, six minutes, whatever. Then you stop. You question the students again. A bit of a discussion. Get some student involvement, some opinion, some thoughts behind that. Then you go for the biggest portion of your lecture. Now the biggest portion of your lecture is it, it occurs in the middle because this is what the lesson or the lecture should be gearing up towards. Now, this is where your lecture, this is where you'll put your most important stuff in there. You'll put your biggest portion of, of sort of, of, of content that they're going to be assessed around. You look to theory, you, you've really sort of, you're really interesting elements. Once you've done that is then again, you give them a question to cover. Bit of a discussion, again, a bit more of a lecture, question, discussion. So in the session, you've got, so that could be based around an hour and a half's lecture, if you like. It could be based around an hour's lecture. It's, it's adaptable, interchangeable. The key working of this is that you have four pre-planned questions. And those four pre-planned questions should be able to link into your outcomes or your assessments. Because again, what you're doing is you're establishing a level of formative assessment then you're checking what the students are, are, are actually taking on board in that lecture as opposed to the students just sitting there having an hour's lecture not taking anything on board disappearing then knocking on your door in four or five weeks time and saying that they've they've not got anything uh they've not remembered anything from the lectures to be assessed upon all right this gives you a different format it's a sp sort of spiked format and the way this what this is really effective because what it does is it brings the levels of interaction. If you've got international students in the room with you, it gives those international students a chance to talk with their peers and digest what you've just been talking about. Because what you need to bear in mind with international students is that there's going to be a level of, of um, there's going to be a language barrier that they've got to try and overcome as well when it comes to digesting your dialogue. Okay. 
So we call this just a bit of a spiked format, um, but it does work really well. What we need to bear in mind though, as we're going along is around this blue line. So we, we need to recognize that attention is going to be dropping as we're going um, towards the end of the session. So at the start of the session, it's always going to be high. At the end of the session, it's always going to be low. So having this spiked structured process, that will mean that we, tr that we keep um, that we keep attention sort of maintaining a consistent level throughout the session as opposed to attention coming in and then just dropping down all the way throughout okay now obviously this takes time to sort of adjust and adapt i mean I'm not suggesting that you go away and you start doing this now when i mean when are we going to lecture again probably next probably be next academic year now but um within this sort of environment, this is a really good thing to consider because from an engagement perspective, it works really well because students are interacting with their peers, their colleagues, they're interacting with you as the lecturer. They've also got something tangible to take away from every lecture because they've got four questions upon which to recall and recap. And what the students will be able to do is within those four questions, they'll be able to make associated um, notes with those questions. They will be able to recall the part of the lecture where the key information was delivered because that in piece of information links to the question. So it's about changing format and structure of our lecture. So from a point of view of managing the learning environment, I mean, I was going to say um, from a Padlet perspective, but um, so I wonder if I can post that link into uh, the chat section let's give it a while oh i'll tell you what let me just uh, bear with me a sec mm -hmm. here we go right so can i post that into there right see if see if that works right so i've posted the link into the chat what I'd like you to do, follow that link, and that's going to take you to a Padlet page. On the Padlet page, if you click on the, um, if you click on the, uh, there's like a, on the bottom right, if you pick, click on the pink circle, on the bottom right of the screen, what that'll do is that'll bring up a sort of like a post-it note on the screen. And what I'd like you to put in there is what are your, or what challenges do you face in that lecture theatre all right so what challenges do you face in the lecture theatre and then in the chat on the right hand side i'd like you to post what your biggest challenge is only now when we're talking about challenge we're talking about those elements in practice that that push you to move away from what you're doing and address something okay so what poses you your biggest challenge so follow the link in the chat for Padlet. Give us some feedback on there or what your challenges are. And then in the chat on the right hand side, I want you to tell us what your biggest challenge is. OK, and then I'm going to bring the Padlet up on the screen for us all to see. Right. Right, we've got some coming over here. My notifications are pinging like mad. It must be very annoying. Students not engaging. It's coming through. Shut students' engagement. Right. So, oh, I'm going to have to turn these notifications off. I'll do that. Right, so let me 
I'll just move these up and I'll share this with everybody. Oh my God. Right, can we all, I can't seem to, because my notifications are going mad because we're all posting. Can we see the, um, can we all see the Padlet screen at the moment? And what we'll do is we'll go through some of these points on here. All right. So, get rid of them. There. Right, they've gone fine. Now, there's my golden idea thing. Here we go. Right, let's share. Share the screen again. Share. There we go. Okay, so we've got then. So the challenges that you face in your learning environment. So we've got low attendance. We've got stopping students from using their handheld devices. Students wanting to tell them. Uh, ah, so the students want you to tell them what's in the exam. Uh, full engagement, students not engaging, uh, difficult to check student learning, different, different levels of interest, and subject matter, lack of student engagement, understanding, teaching business students political economy, student attendance engagement, is that student attendance engagement in political e economy? Students don't follow me after, I have follow up quizzes, but they don't get the point. Mm, it's very difficult. Just the idea around sort of things around um, like relevance and engagement and stuff. OK, that's interesting. Let's go back to. Um, let's go back to our file. Let's go back to this. So that was quite interesting. Some of the things that people um, some of the things that people are getting. So, I mean, what um, with student engagement, what we need to think about is around looking at student engagement as an umbrella term. So, student engagement is an umbrella term. So, what engages one student is going to is going to be totally different to what engages another student. When we talk about student engagement, we've got to think about, well, what falls under that umbrella term? And it's things like interest, it's things like motivation, it's things like uh, relationships. If we think back to um, think back to some of the reasons why students come on the programmes that, that, that they do, some students will come on the programmes because of cultural pressures, social pressures. I mean, I spoke to a student uh, on the clearing phones last year and he, I asked the student what brings him to De Montfort University, and he said to me that it was because his friends are there. So whilst you've got, oh, we've got a question there, point. No, sorry, exactly. I'm just surprised to the answer. <laughs> yeah. So, so with regards to things like, I mean, if we if we if we're faced with a group of students in in a lecture theatre where they're there because their friends are there. If they turn up one day and their friends don't turn up, their engagement level is going to be going to be up, going to be low. But this is sort of this is an unfortunate situation and scenario of of sort of modern day recruitment of higher education. So we have to be we have to be quite sort of clever with this. And from a point of viewing of 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 sort of if pulling students in and getting students to sort of commit to learning whilst we're in their learning environment, we have to look at those motivators. What's in it for them? And this is where we have to think about, well, how, what, can, what, can be my, what can be my carrot that I'll dangle in front of the students to get them to buy in? Now, essentially, we can look at this sort of the classic um, process of, stu of, of students and we, can, and we can break students down into three different areas, three different categories. You've got your, you've got your strategic students, you've got your deep students, and you've got your surface level students. So your surface level students, will and we're talking from a motivational perspective your surface level students will always be those sorts of students that just that just do just enough to pass they just sort of scrape by they'll, 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 they'll come they'll probably they'll probably engage to some degree 
they won't probably go that extra mile like other students will. So deeper students, deep level um, learners are those students that are there 10 minutes before the session. They're the ones that want to ask for extra sort of extra questions. They're the ones that want to do the extra reading. And essentially, they're the ones that they'll teach themselves. The strategic students, so surface, deep, strategic students, the strategic students want to know just what's in the what's in the assessment. And the, and the, the strategic students will physically ask you, is that in the assessment? So when you're talking about how do I engage students, you've got to try and you've got to look at, well, do I understand, do I understand students to the point where do I know what they want to get out of the session? And this is where we go back to this idea around around structure, around that relevance idea, okay, around what we also need to do is think about, well, how are we making it clear as to where our sessional content is linked into things like the assessments? Are we making sure that it's clear to where it's linked into the, to the wider module? The students understand the, the relevance of everything that they're, that they're getting because we're still very we're still very much falling into the, into this into this area of that we've we've got a lot of things that we'd like the students to know these would make them really good employable students but at the end of the day are we trying are we trying to get too much out of year one students are we, are we pushing year one students too much should we just be thinking about well what do students in year one need to know while they get into year two to make them more to make them better second year students it's a really difficult conundrum. One of the things you need to think about from a student, student perspective is, are students motivated? What am I doing to motivate those students? Are students interested? And get some student feedback. Get the, I mean, don't get student feedback from about 400 odd students in your lecture theatre. So think about when you go to those workshops, those seminars groups, and your personal tutor groups, is do you get some information from the students around, around what motivates them? Now, one of the things you can do is, and this is our third part around um, around golden ideas, is this concept of, of pancake questioning. So when you're talking about engagement, some students might not engage in questions because they might not have confidence in engaging. So within a lecture sort of environment and a lecture setting, what you can do is you can use this approach to build participation. All right. Now, this works on um, a sort of a progressive approach. So it works on um, having an open working uh, five stages. So it kicks off with if I'm in a lecture setting, I've got 300 students. One of the things I want to do is I want to get them to engage in some degree of activity. So I'm going to provide them with some questions. My first question is going to be via an open platform. Now, when I say about open platform, I'm talking about um, things like Padlet, things like Mentimeter. An open platform is a, is a place where students can respond to questions without fear of repercussion or fear of singling out. OK, so things like Padlet, things like Mentimeter, things like the chat on the side, they're really useful because it's very sort of um, it can be very anonymized it can be very non sort of abrasive and sort of non-aggressive but all i'm going to be doing with an open platform question is i want to get some degree of response so i might pose quite a sort of a not not a too open and generic question but i might pose something from a question perspective that gives people the opportunity to um, interact and engage with something well i'm not going to know so for example the padlet that we've just used i've set that to anonymous just so people can can contribute. Now, one of the things that does pro, throw up is is around the the idea around well, am I going to get things on there posted that I'm not going to want to read? Well, if you're using Padlet, you are the administrator within that. So, as the administrator, you can then dictate what gets shown and what doesn't get shown. So, you can delete and and extract and and, and manipulate what you need to from those questions. OK, so you manage that as you see fit. But the key thing is the first sort of phase of engagement is if I want to get students to engage in a session, am I giving them a platform to engage? So taking Amos comment earlier around uh, sort of getting those students to engage, it's around am I giving them a platform to engage? 
leading up from that so once i've given them that platform to engage i'm going to i want to get them engaging in small group questions now this doesn't really take much managing all you're asking the students to do is to sort of turn around to the people behind them and form form a group of four three four and answer a question but what i want them to do is i'm going to want them to answer that question individually but then share with the group all right so they're going to have to contribute to the group now, one of the things I don't want to be doing is I don't want to be going any bigger than four, because if I go any bigger than four, it's not really going to have much impact. OK, someone might not be heard in that group. And also what I'm going to want to be doing in that is that I'm going to want to make sure I chuck a timer. In with that question, now you can do that through um, time them on your phone, you can do that through just verbally giving them some time. What you can do is you can give them a timer via um, using something very simple such as if you put, put five minute timer into the screen and then you'll get a five minute timer from Google and what I can do is I can put that on the screen and there's my visual reinforcement what that does is that that gives the students the visual reinforcement there that, that they've got to contribute within that time one of the things you always need to do is with using time is you've got to give students less time than they actually need. Because what that'll do is that will keep them focused and that will keep them sort of. Um, they'll keep them uh, focused and concentrated on the activity in hand. So, for example, I mean, I when I used to work at uh, Cov University, I, I observed a session once and the lecturer, there was a law lecturer and she was. Um, she said to the students right i'm going to give you a task to do blah, blah, blah. She told them the task and then she said i'm going to give you 45 minutes to do that task the students all stood up and went away and then they were all coming back 20 minutes 25 minutes later and they all had costa coffee cups sandwiches sat down first thing they said to this to the member of staff when they sat down is what was the task that we needed to do and they still had time to do that task and far too generous with that at the time if you're too generous with the time that you give, students become disengaged and students become unfocused. Because what we need to do is we're bringing in from the timer, we're bringing that element of challenge into the room. And just because we're in a lecture theatre doesn't mean that we can't bring in that element of challenge, that element of activity. OK. All right, stop sharing. OK, so the use of time is really valuable. So when we go from small questions, we then go to paired questions. So that's where the students then sit next to the person next to them and then they both address or attempt the same question. And again, if we're in a lecture theatre, where we've got 400 students. I'm not essentially going to take loads of feedback from the student. I might not need to take loads of feedback. Because all I'm getting the students to do is just answer a question that I've posed. I might get one or two people to give me some feedback, but only from people that feel genuinely confident to give me some feedback. Because I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I don't want to put anybody in under some under and unnecessary pressure. There's no need for that. I can walk around, I can visually see who's focusing on the questions. I can walk around to the lecture theatres, I can move up the sides, I can go up the middle if I need to. But I want to pose a, a paired question. When we start off on that open platform question and then when we move to the sm small group questions, one of the biggest ways of getting a response from the students is always around how to respond to those answers. If you, get a, if you get an answer from the students and then you just shut that question down or you just you disregard their efforts or you're um, quite derogatory in, in, in their contributions, you, students are always going to switch off and the students are always going to um, pull the shutters down on offering any, any more questions. But whereas if you're really welcoming and you're really warm to those questions, you'll get some really good feedback. Um, so from paired questions, then, then you've got the platform to then start to pose individual questions to the students. By going through these phases and by being at this fourth stage, you're really going to have that capacity then to get the students to contribute to the questions. And again, this is where you can start to bring in things like Mentimeter, you can bring in things like Kahoot, Socrative, those sorts of questions. If you want to bring those in, 
but ideally you want to start to get some interaction from the audience you want the student you want the students to pose you questions but what you need to be aware is if you pose an open question to the audience you're not essentially throwing that question out to anybody you're throwing it out to an open space you will only get responses when you start to direct those questions and you can only really direct those questions to people that are going to be confident and comfortable with responding what you need to do is when you pose the question it's about how you ask for those answers you literally say well everybody want to volunteer some answers can anyone tell me the answer to this question bum 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 who wants to go first and then when you receive that answer then you can start to say right okay that's brilliant no thanks for that it's probably not what we're looking for at the minute but we'll move on to the next question or the best way of taking those responses is to say right okay hold on to that point who wants to build on that question who agrees with what we've just got just here anyone want to come and build on what we've just the answer that we just got here yeah so and just made a point there that you'll find that only ch the chinese respond chinese students respond to direct questioning so so most Ch my chinese students will only respond to direct questions so and there might be something from a cultural perspective there that that's impacting from a question perspective from my sort of background and experience from working with international students is that I've, I've often struggled to get contributions from international students because it's the direct questions that puts them on the spot from using this sort of process what i've done is i've managed to build up their confidence levels and then i've got them to respond it's a really good point and thanks for that um the sort of the, the sort of the pinnacle of this pyramid is around the tutor, the tutor um, driven questions. So it's when the students are then posing questions to you as the lecturer. That's the sort of pinnacle where they want to find out more. Um, they want to find out more around that particular subject. So Anne's just built on that point there around this is the way it is in China. Yeah, it's interesting. And so from a point of view of the Chinese students is when we get the, the Chinese students coming over to the UK around the sort of the questioning methods that we use in in UK based education. I mean, we could there's some there's some probably some good points there. I mean, around around the sort of the direct questions. I mean, and do you think that we should sort of adapt our practice to what the Chinese students are used to? Should the Chinese students sort of conform to what we're used to, or do we need to try and find a balance between the two? What do you think? I think we need to find a balance between the two. I have worked in China for the last three years with um, Chinese students in the Chinese universities. And I've also worked with them in the UK. And um, in the universities in China, they, you know, they, they must not speak unless they're spoken to. Yeah. Um, and so it's it is gradually changing mm. the culture but they're very shy because yeah. they think they sound different to everybody and yeah. so they don't want to feel shamed yeah so. massively yeah i mean my my way to the train of thinking is that i'm looking to i'm look anybody that comes into my sessions i want to empower them to be able to pose those questions themselves and you're right in what you say is that there's there's that sort of there's that um there's that idea around around the educator in the room who are we to question the educator in the room and and for for them to come to the uk and, and to try and adapt and adopt a, a totally different platform of, of questioning is really difficult for them so if we sort of if we're aware of that then that's a that's a really good point i mean one of the things i would probably do is like what Anne said is to have that balance of the two is to try to try to build on that open platform but then have those direct questions and and then just recognize that we don't want to be putting them down um and you got another point you want to make uh, yes the, the way i um try to bring them in is if you're monitoring the room when they're doing the, this paired work or group work and i hear them with good answers for something i then respond to them there and then and then i ask them in the open group so they already feel safe that they know they're going to be giving a correct answer and that yeah. helps to... absolutely yeah so i mean 
building then so from that point where if we've got those sort of those like pre-planned questions and the questions are based very much around what we've just what we've just spoken about within the lecture setting as opposed to me posing the question and the answers locked away in my head and the students trying to guess what answers are in my head then again that's where the confidence comes from but that's a really good point and thanks for that okay so trial something like this from a point of view you don't have to follow this sort of approach but think about that's always a really good bit of advice that i've shared a lot with the pg cap students is around if you've not got engagement in your session and the students are not focused or they're being attentive to what's good are you providing that platform for engagement and that's a sort of a, like an internal question really and questions themselves can be very can be very tr very tricky because what we want to be doing is like what Anne's just been talking where, where possible we want to be using the directive questions but at the same time we've got to try and build up esteem but we don't want to be using questions where students can hide behind those questions for example if you say to students any questions that's a really broad and generic question ideally you empower students enough if they do have any questions they will raise their hand and they will ask those questions um is everyone okay so far i think it's a really it's a really common one that you see i mean it is i mean it's a i class that as what what i call a well-being question is that i'm asking i'm trying to ascertain well-being in the room i'm trying to ascertain if people are okay with where we are if people have got any sort of um any gaps in their understanding but ideally you want to be able to have a platform in the room where people are not following where you are Richard, you think there's too many questions. I um, I observed the session um, before Christmas um, in one of the faculties where I think the lecture lecturer must have asked um, around about. I mean, I can't stop, stop counting at 65 questions because it was a it was a recap session, and the the idea that what the lecturer was doing was trying to promote thought, trying to promote sort of um, in, self inquiry. But what was happening was it was just a constant barrage of questions where the students were really struggling within that room itself there was a large amount of international students and they were getting really um confused and 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 lost with the amount of questions that were in there and try and avoid questions where the answers are, are locked away in your head pose questions where the answers have already been discussed and the answers have already been shared where possible think about your use of pre-planned questions so we've just mentioned this um a minute ago so what i share with you um via the email and if you've not got that we'll circulate them again afterwards but it was the concept of, of, of pre-planned questions so you have some pre-planned questions for students to use and the students to to um come in with now can i share let's see if i can share this Oh, oh no, I'll tell you what, let's just share my screen with you. So I shared with you some pre-planned questions. Now, ideally, these are the questions that um, we're going to go through at the end to establish and to ascertain if you if you've um, If you're actually taking away anything in the session so these are my pre-planned questions and i shared these with you at the, at the start yesterday to have them so these four these four questions are going to be based are based around the content that we've been talking about um, and these four questions are, are what i'm going to be using to, to, as my formative assessment mechanism at the end so there's nothing there that i'm not sharing with you as, as students now it, we, it's not we don't want to be i mean we only want to be providing handouts for those people that absolutely need them within that lecturing environment but essentially our fundamental uh, port of call and our go-to place is is blackboard so realistically we post these onto blackboard for to access and then what we'll do is we'll steer our students towards these pre-planned questions throughout the session we'll have these interlinked into our powerpoint but fundamentally, this is what we're going to be using as our main source of um, of recap throughout the session. And there's real value in doing that. 
there's really real value in in having that element of of pre-planned questions because what that does is that means that you don't have to ask any more questions within the session to ascertain and to check learning's taking place you can just leave it up to your pre-planned questions granted yes you can take questions from the audience because you want to be taking questions um from the session yeah uh, shimim yes the uh, so i'm still recording this and i'll share the link at the end all right so pre-planned questions are, uh, are really useful and really valid all right and really important and what we can do is with these pre-planned questions these link directly within our, our sessional outcomes and it becomes our main source of assessment thus aligning the session so our session is constructively aligned now because we've got outcomes we've got activities and we've got an assessment platform in place which is which is crucial and we we've done loads of work across the institution around the idea and the concept of um around constructively aligning the um the pro people's programs people's sessions but there's still a lot of work for us to do and people still um still got still struggle with that and one of the reasons for that is is the use of outcomes it, people are still using things like understand as a as an outcome all right so think about the use of plan questions so that closes off number three golden idea number three golden idea number four is around our online support so from a point of view of online support what we're talking about there is what we class as high impact low stakes assessment all right now these are what we'd class as unsupported um programs and what we mean by being supported is it that um dmu doesn't support the data that's collected by these so we have to be aware of things like gdpr we have to be aware of things like um of, of data collection and how students are identifying themselves within these um, services. So one of the ones I've missed off of this is Kahoot for some reason. I'm not sure why I've missed it off. But these are the sorts of things that we'd that we'd use to, to ascertain and to assess learning that's taken place within a session. Good thing about uh, these is that they're very easy to 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 develop. They're very easy to trial one of the things is we can we can do this online we can do this by distance uh we can run a kahoot now and we can have the questions on your mobile device um and it's really useful one of the great things around using these is around that that angle of data capture that um we can establish where people's gaps in knowledge are straight away I mean, if you're going to do this at the end of a lecture, you won't be able to sort of act upon those gaps in knowledge. You'd have to take that information forward and deliver it and develop it for the next one. But they've all got really good value. Thing with, with Kahoot, Kahoot will take big numbers. It will take big numbers. I don't think it will take more than 200 and they're paying for, the, for like the, the better option, if you like. So Kahoot is the, uh, is the sort of like the more sort of interactive, um, smart device one where everybody what goes through the questions at the same pace socrative is on again online questioning software but the questions for that are done at the student's pace so everybody gets individual questions to their smart devices um quizzes is the same as as kahoot it's the same format it's the multiple choice questions it's the colored squares on our device or on the on the um tablets or laptops for them for them to answer and everyone moves across at the same time uh mentimeter is obviously really good it's good for data data collection with mentimeter you don't you only get um a couple of slides upon which to use a really good one to use specifically if you're using the um the blackboard collaborate is to use turning point because turning point link works nicely with um with this one um you still so you still have to dip in um outside of using a different um 
a different tab. But again, you can use a multitude of different things around how you sort of share your your slides. But uh, yeah, turning point works really well. The you have obviously got ones that you can embed into Blackboard. You've got um, ones that we can embed onto PowerPoint. So we used to have clickers. Um, where you get the um, you get the like the hand device that you could use like the like you see on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire with like the A B C or D um, buttons on there and they were supported by um, DMU um, infrastructure but I'm not sure if we've got rid of the license on that at the minute but um, but what we've got online is, is really good it's about how you manage that data. So, for example, if you're using Kahoot, if you're getting students to identify themselves, what you need to do is, is um, prevent students from identifying themselves by name. You need to get them to use their P numbers because that's not traceable to anybody that's in uh, in the class. It's not traceable to anybody that's in um, in the faculty in the faculties. Well, in the faculty, sorry, it's not traceable to anybody outside. All right, outside of the institution. Students will obviously know their P numbers. You would know their P numbers from a point of view of being their lecturers or their module leaders, etc. But when it comes to showcasing and demonstrating the, the, the sort of the information for students, we can get, um, we can download the results, we can share that with the students and get them to identify where their, where their gaps in knowledge uh, is really, which is really useful. So that's high impact, low stakes assessment. Um, who's used just as a just as a quick sort of um, identification in the chat? Who's used Kahoot before? Okay, so a couple of you. Rachel's not used it before. Stefan's not used it before. Um, so it's quite useful, user friendly. Um, Rachel and Stefan, if you um, if you come onto the golden ideas for learning and teaching, will we use the? I think there's one uh, one in a couple of weeks. I think if you book onto that, we do use um, Kahoot quite extensively within that, and you'll see it working and interacting. It is really useful. Um, you you need what you need to do is set yourself up as a, a, a login on there and then once you set yourself up and log you can create your quizzes once you've used the quiz you can pretty much reuse it as many times as you like um there are also ones there that, that have been set up by other people that you can access which are really useful um it's a shame i can't really go through it now to be honest is turning point quite new turning points uh reasonably new and i would say i wouldn't say it's it's brand spanking new so it's been around for a while and it's it's it, it's very basic in its look um it's very basic in its look it's nothing like kahoot kahoot's very jazzy and snazzy um and it's really good interaction one of the things we need to be aware of is that with students coming into DMU, is students are often already exposed to these sorts of things um, outside of um, outside of DMU. And they're, it, in most compulsory education systems, they they're all using things like Kahoot. I mean, I know my eldest daughter; she uses it at, at her school in some of her lessons. Um, would it work well for online learning? I observed a lecture uh, that was delivered online. Um, by a member of staff in HLS, and he used Turning Point very well. You can't be too elaborate on your questions. You have to be quite sort of um, structured. Um, multiple choice, true, false questions, those sorts of things. It's a little bit, uh, anything other than that, it's, it's not very sort of dynamic. It is uh, very much though, um, black text on a white background. And you, there's not a lot you can do with amending and changing the background there. Um, who's used so who's used Socrative before? Mm, I'm not sure if it will do any self correction. I'll have to I'll have to look into that one for you. All right. So good. Um, 
good portion of people haven't used Socrative. So Socrative is a really good one because Socrative can be used. It's very the questions are more individual. So if you're in a lecture, if you're in that lecture setting, you can get people to use um, Socrative on their mobile devices. Um, let me just. I think we just need to do. Let me just see. Be there we go. Right. So. Oh, what's this here? OK, so on your um, let's have a go at Socrative just to give us a bit of. Um, a bit of an example of what of what we're going to be doing. So on your smart devices, can you go to. Where have you gone? There you are. OK, so can you go to let's see if I can share the link? You need to type into your um, web browser. Um, be Socrative. If you go onto your smart, if you're going to your phones or your tablets, whatever, and if you type in be Socrative and then in the login, it, you'll see a square at the top. It will say login and then you need to click on student. And then the we'll do a we'll do a general knowledge quiz, and the room is the room is G M Hughes uh, G H S one two three. So let's be Socrative. Click on student login, and then the room is G M Hughes one two three. And then we're going to do a general knowledge quiz. And you should be able to have a go at that quiz now. So I'm going to see if I can get the results on here. Right, we've got seven people. There we go, results. All right, so I'm going to share with you what I what I get. So as you're working through those questions at your own pace, this is what I'm seeing here. So this is what I'm seeing. So the results are coming in to me now. I've got progress. I can see the questions. I can see how people are working through them. I've hidden the names so not to uh, put extra pressure on people. Don't worry, Bakri, you're all right. You can take your time. Where are you joining us from, Bakri? Um, I'm in Sudan at the moment. Wow. I don't, I've never lectured in Sudan before. Right, so we've got someone, so we've got a finisher. So, obviously the person's finished, but what we're doing, we're allowing everyone else to, to catch up. But what I so what I can see is how even though that person's finished, we can still see how they perform. So yeah, granted they've got one hundred percent progression, and other people are starting to uh, to finish now. But what I can start to get now with this is I'm starting to build a picture of where people need greater development. Now, if these questions were all aligned to our particular curriculum or our particular discipline. I'd be able to 
see where I need to develop people's knowledge. Okay. So we've got one question here that's got 44%. So it's around the Panama Canal. Uh, it provides a shipping link between which uh, two oceans with a grammatical error there for two. All right, so we've got South people, people going North Atlantic in the Arctic, South Pacific to the North Atlantic, North Atlantic to North Pacific. And then on the bottom there, we can have an explanation. So ideally, when you answer that question, then we get that explanation. So these sorts of things take literally minutes to, to build up. It's really, they're really useful and really, um, really sort of really engaging so i can have a multitude of different questions in a question bank i mean but i actually only use this general knowledge model for, for demonstration purposes but if you've got this within your um within your field and answering those questions these are the sorts of things that can bring that element of dynamism and bring that element of engagement to those sessions or those subjects that are over the or what you would class as that little bit dry all right so Trying to see, trying to see who's done the best there. Tell you what, I'll have a look. I'll, I'll unshare this and then I'll have a look. Let's have a look. Tell you what, it's a, it's a draw between Anne and Musa. Well done. I don't know about anybody else, but there's. I think. Uh, we turn into a nation of people doing quizzes at the minute. All right, let's go back to that. So that is what we'd class. So that was Socrative. So Socrative is really useful, really simple to set up. In fact, let me just go back. Uh, so Socrative is really simple to set up, really e easy to use. It works based on Oh, hang on a minute. Where have we gone? Let me just go back. I've just come out of that. Uh, maximum number of students you can use Socrative on. I think it's quite big. I think it'll take big numbers. I don't think it'll take things like 200 odds. I think you probably you do you probably get a good 60 out of it, something like that, 60, 70 students. The most I've used it with is 58, which I found really, really useful. And I got some really good. Um, do you know if a Socrative quiz can be embedded into Microsoft Suite? Pass on that one. I think that's a really good question. Um, it maybe I don't know. I probably need to look at that. So really simple with the quizzes. So you set yourself up a login. You give yourself a room name. The room name stays the same all the time. It only works based on the quizzes that you run. So you you'll run a particular quiz. So I can click on one of these, and that's when the quiz runs. So it's re so really simple, really straightforward. You click on create new, and then you start to build your answers. So you have got multiple choice, true and false, short answer. With Kahoot now, there's loads more other things you can bring in. So you can do things like drag and drop. You can do ratings. You can do um, you can do true false. You can do compare and contrast things on there. They've really developed that and elaborated on that more now. Whereas Socrative, Socrative is still the only one that does the individual process so yeah really straightforward just click on multiple choice put your question in there give yourself some correct answers mark your right answer and away you go really straightforward um let's uh stop sharing that right it's just got some questions coming in let's have a look could this be used for online learning if the students do it at different times yes the, it's it's available until the students finish the last question and, and until you log out of it. So you drive that. Um, no worries, Shamim, you take care. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, if you can, um, so you drive that. When you're logged in and you activate the quiz, it's when you cl when you close the quiz off, that's when it stops. So you could leave that open. It's the same for, same for, um, same for Kahoot, really. You can use it for online learning. You just need the online pin. That's all. I mean, we could do a Kahoot quiz now whilst we're all here. And if I put the pin on and just go through the questions on the screen, you could use your um, handset to answer those questions. So it's all really interactive. That's the good thing about 
been in this situation now the only ba the only barrier that we've got against us here is the physical physical sort of attention um physical attention the physical attendance barrier that's the only thing that we've that we've got an issue with at the minute everything else you can just do online i mean we're really lucky to have collaborate we can do loads of stuff with that and share that yeah i would say you can probably i'd say go for it give it a while um where are we here let me find here we go all right so that was high value low stakes assessment so the final one of the five is around engagement and how you deliver so what we need to bear, bear in mind is that um, from a point of view of um, of engagement again going back to this engagement angle it's around students now there's we're dealing with a demographic of students with the majority of our customer base at DMU is it's very much this on demand I don't know why that's uh, there. I very much this on-demand um, culture. So it's very much this sort of takeaway culture. This idea of um, of working for an answer when all the answers are, are there online for me to to get access to. Um, even down to things like like eating. So why do I need to why do I need to cook and prepare myself a meal when I can click on just eat and I can get something delivered to me for in like 20 minutes why do i need to um why do i need to wait for music when i can go on spotify and i can download as much music as i, as I possibly want i can go on the, i can go on playstation i can play a computer game against someone in the totally opposite corner of the world you know what i mean the, those sorts of limitations now are, are far gone and what we need to what we need to bear in mind is that the fact that we're dealing with a demographic of students where the ex there is an expectation to be engaged when they walk through the room. There's that expectation to be interested and to be sort of captivated. So we need to bear that in mind. We need to think about, well, what am I going to be doing to, to, to sort of captivate those students? So from a point of view, it's, you've got to think about, well, you as the presenter, your students are focusing on you as that primary source in that lecture theatre. So if you're if you're quite sort of captivated and if you're quite confident from go then confidence breeds confidence students will get confidence from seeing you being confident in the lecture theater if you deliver your session with with with, with poise with sort of with and having a bit of a sort of enigma around you and a bit of an aura of professionalism students will take great comfort from that Whereas if you go into a lecture theatre and you're really stuttering and you don't know your material and your slides are full of mistakes and, and, and errors and your pictures are all out of sync and, and students are posing questions and they're throwing you straight away, then there's always going to be those um, those questions around that. And students, as soon as students stop getting that sort of idea around confidence, they, they'll switch off straight away. I mean, this is where we've got to think about you as the presenter do you um do you exude that confidence i mean when i used to um, work at leicester college we used to do a lot of work with people at, um, with members of staff that delivered um courses at glen parver young offender institutions and one of the things that was obviously, um, someone that worked there and when I, I was talking to some staff and one of the members of staff there told me that they literally have to they had to invent this alter ego when they were presenting because they couldn't be themselves when in the presence of these um, of the inmates because if the inmates found anything out about them they could use that to their advantage and use that as sort of a weapon against them really so what they started to do is they started to develop these alter egos of people when they were presenting so they had a, a sort of a teacher persona that, that they stepped into when they were delivering and that's the sort of thing you want to think about. So when you're in that lecture theatre, do you step into that lecturer alter ego? And do you breed that confidence? Do you command that attention from the students? OK, and what you need to think about as well is think about the levels of students that are in that room. Think about um, that not everybody um, learns at the same pace. Yeah, not everybody in that room, if you have everyone in that room, a pair of size 10 trainers and ask them to run, 
how many students in that room will be able to run a marathon, how many of those students will be able to run around the corner, how many of those students will be able to run around the block, how many of those, how many of those students will even be able to put those size 10 trainers on. It's around thinking about, okay, that not everybody learns at the same pace, but thinking about the support levels that people need. Try where possible to build rapport and build rapport with the students through, through empathy, really, of under, trying to understand that students are human. And just because students are turning up late, they're not turning up late because it's a, it's a personal attack on you and your professional practice. But students may turn up late because of, the, because of certain commitments and certain issues that they have. So on the screen are three, uh, are four different people, and those four different people conduct different styles. I mean, at the at the bottom there in, in the wheelchair is Matt Hansen. Matt Hansen um, is a, an ex Leicester Tiger, and he was um, he suffered an injury on the rugby pitch and he left him paralysed. But he's one of the most sort of, sort of one of the most motivational speakers you'll ever see because he uses his stories and his background. I mean, he's not got he's not got that physical presence but what he does is he captivates you through his dialogue and through his storytelling and through his, his tone and his pitch and he uses his vocal voice fantastically if you look at steve jobs steve jobs was always around um he was always around the pitch around the technology he used to wear the same polo neck jeans and trainers every time he released a new piece of apple technology because it wasn't about him it was about the technology but yet he still had that awe and that enigma about him when he was delivering to students and uh, students delivering to the tech specialists because of the, the quality of his dialogue and he knew that product inside out. And then you've got people like uh, Michelle and Barack Obama that they've got the personalities that they've got on that stage and how they can, they sort of, their tone and their presence and their, their use of, of, um, of voice, really interesting to watch. And that's a really good point is that find somebody that you can relate to and look at what they do from a from a presentation perspective and try and steal certain aspects of their practice. And that's something that I've done in my sort of 16 years of teaching is that I've met different people along the way and I've stolen elements of their practice and used them in my practice. But one of the things I've always maintained is that I'm always prepared when I go into those lectures and I know my content and I know what's coming next. And I'm always very, always confident. And I always sort of exude that confidence, even if inside I'm not very confident, on the outside I am. What we need to think about, though, is around the sort of types of lecturers that we are. And so um, Brown and Minogue talk about five different types of, of of lecturers and the different types of presenters. So you've got oral presenters, visual, exemplary, uh, eclectic, and amorphous. And you'll see that in any institution that you go to, you'll see all of these different types of, of lecturers knocking about. But the ones that always get the greater feedback and build the greater rapport with the students are those ones that bring in um, those exemplary methods or those eclectic methods as well, because the students warm to those elements of of um, of confidence, but also those elements of humour. And humour is a really difficult thing to use in in that sort of lecture setting because it's it can be very dangerous to use humour before you understand and know your audience. One of the other um, things that I did uh, I sent with the handout is I sent you. There's a journal paper that this um, uh, there's a handout, sorry, that's, that's sort of like top tips for, for lecture, and it's taken from this um, Brown and Minogue paper. So feel free to dip into that towards the end. Just to finish up on, we need to think about okay, let's look at our um, international students that are in the room, and Anne, Anne rightly gave us some really good pointers around international students. But what we need to think about is around the use of dialogue with our students and the use of opportunities to discuss and digest. International students will really take uh, will take great value from the, the fact that they can revisit um, sessional content on things like Blackboard and on things like um, any sort of notes and any sort of quizzes and those sorts of things. If they can go back over them, that provides them with really good opportunities to really solidify their understanding, not only of, of, the, of the discipline, but also of the, of the use of English as well. They might need greater opportunities for questions and for one-to-one. -one. Don't be afraid 
um, to allow international students to sit together in in lectures as long as that's well managed as not because what they'll do is they'll, they'll support each other and they'll provide peer support for each other which is really important so i'm a big believer of allowing international students to sit together not everyone's in favor of that that's just personal preference a couple of points that you really need to be aware of is that from a, one of the a really good um, strategy both for international students but also for students with learning difficulties is to allow them to build glossary of terms so you, we use a large proportion of it of, of sort of um, industrial jargon in our field so allowing international students and students that suffer from things like learning barriers to have that capacity to build a glossary helps their understanding of terminology but also helps their industrial language develop and build and be aware that you're going to have to explain jargon so always work on the basis of introduce first and then use as opposed to use jargon throughout until someone stops you and asks you a, a, a question around it but be aware that your dialogue that you're using is obviously shaped by years of industrial experience and academic experience people that are coming in new and fresh to the field are not necessarily going to have that experience Final piece is around um, a piece of work by Sue and Wood around students' perceptions of what a quality lecturer should be. And there are a couple of, there's five key points there and around the talk about sort of lecturers providing speedy feedback is, is, is really useful. Humour, again, is really useful in, in what they perceive as a quality lecture. But the sort of the be-all and end-all of what students perceive as what a quality lecturer should be is someone that is, has really outstanding subject knowledge so that any question that's that's fired out to them they they have that and we're quite lucky within our field because we already hold those high levels of subject knowledge if we didn't have those high levels of subject knowledge we wouldn't have the jobs that we do so we're quite lucky that we that we have that okay so to sort of to, to close off we've got our um our final task so what i would like you to think about and what i would like you to just comment in the in the chat portion please is what uh what two elements of practice will you change as a result of this session so i'd like to give me two elements of your practice please rachel straight in now more use of quizzes well done rachel And just a point around your um, your point on uh, asynchronous classes for students in China. You, what you need to be aware of is, is can the students access Kahoot via their web browsers in China? Just think about those IT infrastructural restrictions. You might just want to check that they can actually access that. Back we're talking about classroom and theatre management. I love that. Moose is Stefan, better question in yet? Okay, good. Any more? Maria? Define my alter ego. Nice one. Yeah, become a superhero, Maria. Not all heroes wear capes. Anne's going to use some Socrative. Yeah. Bakri's going to use more online tools. I mean, one of the things I've really learned just from using this Collaborate is, uh, is how sort of sort of interchangeable and intertransferable it is. I mean, it's not really... I always thought that it would be quite, there would be loads more barriers to doing these sorts of things, but there really isn't that many barriers. The only thing, the only downside I can think of is that whilst I've been rabbiting on, you could have gone and made a cup of tea <laughs> and been sitting there drinking it whilst I've been rabbiting on. Maybe I should make more tea. All right, so that pretty much concludes the session. If you need the PowerPoint sending, can you just let me know in the chat, please? And I will forward that on to you. If you have got any specific questions in regards to uh, practical tips, practical usage, please drop me an email and I will happily um, take you through various bits and bobs. So for example, Rachel, you said that you've not used Kahoot before. 
So if you drop me a, if you drop me an email, Rachel, then we can put some time in the diary, and I can, I'll take you through it on. We can do it through Teams if you like, so I can share my screen, and you can see. We'll use um, Kahoot and things if that's um, if that's useful. Okay, no worries. All right, so uh, hopefully that has been of value. Thank you for engaging. It's nice to have. I've, oddly enough, I've had more people attend the virtual version than we've had attend the physical version of this session. But uh, it's been useful nonetheless. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. And st stay safe, stay well. And yeah. hopefully we'll hopefully we'll be back at DMU soon. Okay, yeah, thank thanks. you. For your, um, please, I want to ask you regarding um, golden ideas for teaching and learning in higher education. Yeah. Um, I need the slides, please, if you have it, if you still have it. Yeah, Musa, you came to the PG, you came to the one that was PG cert specific, didn't you? Yeah, I went to that that one. Yeah. All right, mate. Yeah, no worries. I'll send them over to. You. I need to if you have it. Yeah. I've yeah. Got the slide. I haven't seen a uh, uh, response from you. I know you yeah. might be very busy. Oh, you like? You won't yeah. believe. I know. I believe. I know. Yeah. Crazy time. Yeah. No worries, Moose. I'll uh, I'll send them over to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, mate. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.